two perigee plus zero 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 eight five zero zero seven six four zero three zero 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 two nine or three eagle houston we houston we see you on the stairable over Roger, Eagle, then dot. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle, Eagle has wings. Roger. The Eagle has wings. On its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth, it fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Neil, this is Houston, loud and clear. Break, break, buzz, Never before had so many people been attuned to one event at one time. The world waited, curious, wondering, aware, like a sleeper wakened in the night by a faraway sound. A moment sensed, more than understood. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It was almost dangerous. And you lose sight of the fact that it's a vacuum out there, and if you spring a leap next to it, you're going to be dead. Uh oh.
we'll digress for a second to discuss one of the main defenses that people make to show or argue that we had to have gone to the moon. And they often say that there would have been so many people involved in the conspiracy, it would have been impossible to keep it quiet. The only people who would have known about the hoax would have been those on a need to know basis. And that would have been very few people. You have your astronauts, you have the people filming everything and building the locations, and you have the people authorizing it, and that's it. Everybody else would have been doing their one task in the line and sequence of events that they were responsible for. And this segues into another defense made by people who believe we went to the moon, and that is why didn't NASA have them do things over after they made mistakes? And the reason for that is that this was live, and not everybody was in on it. And those hundreds of people you see at Mission Control, they're not in on it. You got the surgeons, they're monitoring the heart rate. You have the data guys, they're monitoring whatever is coming in on their feed. And everybody is looking at a live event and all over the world people are monitoring a live event. So there were no do-overs. In the first three segments, I'm quite certain about the conclusions that have been drawn. And we will return to the heavy artillery in the final segment. But for this segment, I want to sort out a few unknowns. And these are pieces of information that I've discovered which are of peculiar interest to the entire moon hoax culture. Now, I am not the first to suggest there's some sort of Geppetto character in the rafters above pulling the astronauts by some sort of harness with fishing wire. Like, why does Charlie Duke want John Young to push on his head here? Um, oops, here I go again. Give me a help. There you go. Okay, just push, start pushing on my head. Give me a hand. Okay, here we go. So he pushes down on his head and his feet seem to levitate backwards. Okay, I don't claim to have found the wires, but I do think I found the attachment to the wires. This is the OPS, oxygen purge system. The arrows are pointing at those little bars there. Those bars were originally designed to carry a bag on them, but the only mission they actually used the bag was Apollo 12. And here you can see the strap from the bag attaches to the top of the backpack on that bar. And even though they didn't use that bar for anything else on later missions, the bar remained part of the equipment. What is not part of the equipment and has never been spotted before, as far as my research has revealed, is that there are little tiny rings that hang out of that bar compartment. And I could only spot these in this one clip from Apollo 16 at Station 5. But in this clip, you can see them quite clearly, and you can see them dangling, and you can see the shadow that they make. And there is no official explanation for those rings. And this in a mission that has been analyzed to the nines. No technical manual, no internet discussion, no mission report mentions these rings. And if there were wires carrying the astronauts around and making them do all these herky-jerky moments and jump up in the air five feet straight and lope around the so-called lunar surface, then the wires were attached to these little rings. So we pick up the action on EVA-3, Apollo 16, and the astronauts have just returned from House Rock, which is that big rock they were gallivanting in front of in the beginning of this segment. Charlie Duke is switching magazines in the 16 millimeter movie camera, which is at the top right of the screen. He's turning it now. Watch his visor, because I believe you are going to see an artificial light source flicker on and off very quickly. At first you will see the light travel 
up his uniform and then it will flash on in his visor and then it will flash off. Boom, there it goes. Now, NASA's official position is that there were no artificial lights used on the surface of the moon. The astronauts were issued flashlights, but they were only used inside the ships. Here is a picture of the actual flashlight used by John Young during this mission. That's a better size one. Watch the beam of light travel up the spacesuit. It will go on his left shoulder and then swing over towards his right shoulder, under his chin, and right up into the visor. There you just saw it again, and now we're going to watch in slow motion. Just look to the right of the arrows, keep your eye below the visor, and watch the beam of light. There it is, and then into the visor. Boom. The light source is below the horizon. It's coming from underneath the shot, not above it. It's not the sun. It's an artificial light. The light flashes on beneath the rest of the scenery. In every other shot, you see the sun must be at the top of the visor. On the left, the light source is below the scenery, and on the right, it's at the top of the visor where it is in every other shot. You see, the vibration of my voice box makes the air vibrate between us. Then when the air vibrates your eardrum, you hear what I'm saying. But maybe you've seen a demonstration of a bell under a glass jar. With normal air inside the jar, you could hear the bell clearly. But when the vacuum pump drew the air out of the jar, there was nothing inside to carry the vibrations of the bell. Nothing until the air was let back into the jar. sounds in space, um, it's odd to have a hammer or a metal tool and bang it against something and hear absolutely nothing. You can, you know, sound won't travel in a vacuum, so there you are outside and you could be hitting something, no sound at all. In space, since there's no, uh, there's no atmosphere, there's no air, mm -hmm. if you bang on something when you're doing your spacewalk, you will not be able to hear that. And this leads us to the dilemma of our final segment. All modern astronauts, such as Piers Sellers and Mike Massimino, claim to hear absolutely nothing when they're out on the International Space Station in the vacuum, banging away with metal tools and objects, whereas during the Apollo missions, all kinds of sounds have been recorded that should not be possible if they are on the moon in the vacuum of space. That does not sound like the spacesuit acting like a drum at all. It sounds like a metal hammer striking a metal object repeatedly with authority. Pictured is Alan Bean during Apollo 12 striking a metal core tube into the so-called lunar surface with a metal hammer. This is an interview with Apollo astronauts Alan Bean and Pete Conrad done by the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. They are once again taking the position that the sound is coming through the hand and transmitting into the microphones in the helmet. Alan Bean says, I would have said it wasn't possible. And Pete Conrad responds, the other guy can't hear it. If the sound is coming through Alan Bean's microphone, then like his voice, it must be transmitted directly into the headset of Pete Conrad. So his statement makes no sense. Alan Bean's statement makes a lot of sense since it would not have been possible in a vacuum. When Bean says, I would have said it wasn't possible, he has science on his side. And he also has NASA on his side, at least up until August 19th, 2011. And this brings us to the most important graphic in the film. This is a web page that has been disappeared from the internet by NASA as of August 2011. 
It was at NASA.gov running concurrently with the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal between 2009 and September 2011. However, this page, which was created for children, you can see the banner at the top, Lunar Science for Kids. This page directly contradicts the assertions made in the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal concerning the hammering sounds in Apollo 12, 15, and 17. This page talks about the science involved with sound on the moon and it does so correctly and that is why nasa has disappeared it from the web the contradiction between the journal and this page was brought up in the very popular moon zoo forum and that is where i first became aware of the situation reader tom 128 pointed out the contradiction between the site for children and the journal and i went looking for the site for children and could not find it I then went to my favorite research tool, the Wayback Machine at archive.org, and I was able to find an old version of the page that NASA did not clean up. And whenever I see information go missing from the web, it always starts me thinking, and this was the genesis of the film. At that moment, I became a NASA moon hoax researcher. You've seen the image on the right of the graphic before. That is Alan Bean hammering a core tube during Apollo 12. And this is the sound of such hammering. The graphic is problematic for NASA because of the contradiction to the journal and the graphic is correct science. And I quote, Sound needs something to travel through to get from one place to another. On the moon, since there is no air, sound cannot travel above the surface. So, there are no sounds on the surface of the moon. When the Apollo astronauts were out on the moon's surface, they could only talk to each other and to mission control by using the radios in their air-filled helmets. Even when the astronaut in the photo to the right hit a metal tube into the ground with a hammer, no sound was made. All of the sounds so far analyzed were made by the astronauts as they were handling tools, but now we are going to analyze some sounds that are made a distance away from the astronauts. So what you just saw appears to be a smoking gun. That scene, which was broadcast live to the world during Apollo 15, shows astronaut James Irwin. He takes this cord or band off of a canister and those canisters are in the mesa table, which Irwin is standing in front of. He unravels the cord which has two metallic locks at the end of it, pictured here. They look like bullets. He takes that off, he unravels it, he reaches back with his right hand, and he throws the cord away. Let's take another look at it. So the argument has been made for the hammering that the sound is coming through the glove and it's miraculously getting into the microphones. But we don't have to deal with that argument because James Irwin releases the object and it hits the ship and he's not touching it and that sound is picked up by the microphone. The microphone inside the astronaut's helmet. And you can always tell that that's the microphone in play because you will always hear the sound of the suit air supply system in the background whenever the astronaut is transmitting and you will hear this sound remain on for a split second after the astronaut stops transmitting. Both the outside of the ship and the inside of the ship in the cabin are in the vacuum because the lunar module does not have an air hatch. So when the astronauts leave the lunar module, it is depressurized. Microphones in the lunar module plug into the audio centers. The only voice possibilities are through the use of the headsets. 
They took off with six microphones, three Snoopy caps. Each astronaut also had a lightweight headset at launch. While they were on the moon and the suspect audio event took place, they were wearing their Snoopy caps. Communication cables, which are the umbilical cords that the astronauts plugged into while in the lunar module, as you can see from the checklist, were stowed prior to EVA. Also looking at the same exact checklist, we can see that the lightweight headsets were also stowed prior to EVA. So, there were no live microphones inside the cabin. The future of space exploration, the emerge of private space sector and daily life in space. These are among the topics we discuss today with two special guests from International Space Station. Terry Wirtz, the current ISS commander, and Samantha Cristoforetti, the first Italian female astronaut in space. Hi Terry, buongiorno Samantha, thank you very much for joining us on Euronews. I would like to start by asking how you feel about the other three crew members returning to Earth. As the next crew will arrive at the end of March, do you feel a bit lonely up there in space? You know, it was, it was, it was sad seeing... And what comes after the International Space Station once its mission is over? How do we ensure the presence of humans in space? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. Orion is getting ready to launch. My name is Kelly Smith, and I work on navigation and guidance for Orion. Orion is NASA's next generation spacecraft. Built with versatility in mind, it can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before to an asteroid, or even onto Mars. For these missions, Orion has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Before we can send astronauts into space on Orion, we have to test all of its systems. And there's only one way to know if we got it right. No astronauts will be aboard. The spacecraft is loaded with sensors to record and measure all aspects of the flight in every detail. It all begins with launch aboard a Delta IV as the spacecraft and the upper stage begin their first lap around Earth. Mission Control in Houston is monitoring the progress of the flight. Orion's over 100 miles up and going about 17,000 miles per hour. Just as it passes over the Indian Ocean, we lose communication. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice. 
once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. It's great to be a part of this first space flight for Orion, and we're looking forward to beginning a new chapter in human space exploration.